Hello, everybody. Welcome to Narrative Live on a Wednesday evening. It's so good to be with you tonight. We have a really interesting show coming up. We're going to talk to Stephen Hoffenberg. We have not spoken to Stephen Hoffenberg in almost a year, I think, maybe even longer. But Stephen Hoffenberg, of course, you know him as a great friend of Jeffrey Epstein when they started off. Maybe not so much good friends at the end when Hoffenberg spent 18 years in jail for the crimes that uh, Epstein committed. We're going to talk to him about this incredible settlement that came out just yesterday between Prince Andrew and Virginia Jeffrey, a $16 million settlement, an unbelievable amount when you think about it for an allegation of this kind. But for Andrew, it's a great getaway because finally he's able to, you know, not have to face the music in terms of going to uh, see a, a judge and an answer to all his you know, misdeeds with Ms. Givry, but he also gets to hide a lot of the history behind himself, maybe even the entire royal family, and also the other things that the royal family sometimes did, like the, the criminal aspects of their behavior, of their activities maybe sometimes, but also their arms trading and various other things. So that's the show tonight. It's really exciting. And uh, I think I've got Steve on the phone. Steve, are you there? How are you good, doing tonight? Good. I'm doing fine. What about yourself? I'm doing really well. You know, I was figuring out today that, that when we originally first met, it was like July 2019. It's a long time ago. We've got a bit of a history. Yes, we do. And it's really interesting history because, I mean, here we are. I would never imagined three years later or two years later, whatever it might be, that we would be sitting here and saying the whole thing is still not being revealed. Because in my opinion, as we look at the settlement, it doesn't appear to me like we're ever going to find out the truth about Jeffrey Epstein when, you know, the victims are being, I don't want to say they're bought off because they certainly deserve the money. The settlement is important. They get the money and they should get the money. But still, $16 million and they will, we'll never find out the real story. How was the intent of Jeffrey Epstein in his original plans so that the real story, the inside story, would never be told? Mm -hmm. And indeed, that's... That was his plan all along. Seems to have worked. Also in the sidelines, we've got, we've got Ghislaine uh, still, you know, she's been found guilty, which is interesting, but she's not been sentenced yet. And that makes people believe that there's some sort of agreement with her coming as well. Do you get a sense that that's going to be the case? Well, the question is, will there be a mistrial decided by the court? Mm -hmm. If they do have a sentencing date, but they have a series of applications in front of the court demanding a mistrial. Mm -hmm. So if there is a mistrial based on the jury's defective performance, then there's a good chance you'll get off. Wow. And of course, the case there around the jury, can you remind us a little bit about why there was one juror, basically, who seemed a little conflicted there? Well, no, there's actually three supposed oh. jurors that they announced who did not fill out the truthful statement about their history regarding sexual crimes. Ah, so that's what it's going to be so, about. Okay, I, I understand. I didn't realize it was three. I thought there was just the one. So that makes it a very different well, case. One that we have seen go to the media give interviews, which is shocking. Mm -hmm. And there's two others that have come forward and said they made an error in their paperwork for the court. Do you think that there is an element of um, bribery or any corruption involved in that? Do you think like, there's any of these uh, jurors might have been influenced in a way? Well, to make a charge of bribery, that's a very important yeah. finding. That we don't want to do that. But it's, it's hard. Yeah. It's very hard to bribe a juror that would be taking an enormous risk. Right, of course. Saying that they lied to the court in order to serve on the jury. I mean, that's a terrible misconduct. And I don't think so. You don't think so? I think it's but you never know. You never you know. Never know. It's interesting because we, yeah. we have all these things happening at the same time. We have, you know, they all seem to be very coordinated. You, even the Andrew Schiffrey case coming so soon after the Ghislaine case. And then we're also, you know, some of us uh, who are a little bit more globally minded are also watching what's happening in Israel with Bibi Netanyahu and his plea deal all seem to be coming to a head at the same time. And that is interesting because, you know, maybe there's some grand bargain we're not really aware of and a lot of horse trading going on behind the scenes. It's quite oh, possible. I'm sure there is. Yeah. I'm sure behind the scenes, there's a tremendous amount taking place right. that we don't know about. 
And we and we probably won't find out about that either. I want to share with everyone the statement put out by uh, the attorney who seems to be everywhere, this David Boise. Boy, he has a lot of clients in interesting cases. And in here he writes to the Honorable Lewis A. Kaplan, Dear Judge Kaplan, we write jointly with the counsel for defendant to advise the court that the parties reached a settlement in principle of the above referenced action. The parties anticipate filing a stipulation of dismissal of the case within 30 days, the Exhibit A. In the interim, the parties request that the court suspend all deadlines and we appreciate the time and effort the court has devoted to this matter. Respectfully, David Boys. I'm really surprised by this because, you know, not long ago, maybe a hundred days ago, they were saying a lot of terrible things about Virginia Jeffrey and Andrews Campbell. They were really discrediting her. And now suddenly it looks like they were able to come to reality or come to the truth, find the light. I don't know, whatever you want to say. Things have changed for them, haven't they? They changed substantially mm-hmm. to Virginia's side. And there was no question that the damage that was occurring in the UK and around the world to the Crown mm-hmm was a disgrace and a disaster for the Queen and the Crown itself. Absolutely. Especially at a time of change. You know, she's slowly handing over the reins to Charles. It's not a good time to have his brother out there with these kind of charges. It's certainly not the kind of thing you want to be taking over when you're a new monarch. Well, I think she wanted to, to help Andrew to the point of not worrying about this particular drama, which yes. could wreck, wreck his future. Indeed it could. And yeah. it's interesting that it's um, that she's going to be the one play, paying the $16 million. It's coming from the Queen. It's not even coming from Andrew. Well, she's got plenty of money, so that's <laughs> not an issue. Yeah. I guess so. I wanted to look at the statement itself, this actual statement that they put out, which is an interesting PR kind of statement. It's very nuanced, but we should look at the nuance because there is some change here, certainly in how Andrew is perceived or what Andrew is willing to say about Jeffrey. So um, it goes like this. It says, Virginia Jeffrey and Prince Andrew have reached an out-of-court settlement. The parties will file a stipulated dismissal upon Ms. Giffrey's receipt of the settlement, the sum of which is not being disclosed, but we can now disclose that it is $16 million or 12 million pounds. Prince Andrew intends to make a substantial donation to Ms. Giffrey's charity in support of victims' rights. And Prince Andrew has never intended to malign Ms. Giffrey's character and he accepts that she has suffered both as an established victim of abuse and as a result of unfair public attacks. It is known that Jeffrey Epstein had trafficked countless young girls over many years. Prince Andrew regrets his association with Epstein, regrets is the word they used, and commends the bravery of Ms. Giffrey and other survivors in standing up for themselves and others. He pledges to demonstrate his regret for his association with Epstein by supporting the fight against the evils of sex trafficking and by supporting its victims. It's the official statement. What do you think of that? It's quite a statement. Mm -hmm. That's statement doesn't match what he has said since uh, 2019. That's for sure. Dramatic Except difference. Except death. Mm-hmm. Complete opposite to everything he said and to what his lawyers said and to his interviews. It's uh, very sad. The whole case is a public drama that's incredibly sad. It would be reviewed in history as one of the most unusual cases that ever occurred in this type of crime. Mm -hmm. This scandal was horrendous. I mean, there's not been a scandal like, well, maybe the scandal where the king abdicated King George. I mean, you know, this is very, it's really rare to have a scandal that can threaten the monarchy in the way that this scandal has threatened this monarchy. And, And, you know, maybe it's now saved. Maybe this is a Hail Mary and they finally have saved it. But, the damage it's caused to the crown, I think, is going to be around for a long time. I think it's a the loss of faith amongst the British people has, has been is tremendous. But the crown is part of the UK and the British people's life. Mm-hmm. So the crown is going to be there. Mm-hmm. It's a question of the public feeling. Mm-hmm. They're not going to eliminate the crown, that's for sure. No, not right now, for sure. I don't think they can, but, you know, but they're the feelings towards them, certainly. It's not a great way for Charles to take over, you you know, and it's certainly not a great way for well, the Queen to end her life. The better part is that she had the wisdom to motivate the settlement, mm-hmm. which was a complete change of approach. 
It's true because mostly if you're the son of a monarch, you don't get to need to worry about these things a lot of the time because you don't get, you don't get charged. There's no, um, you know, in most cases you'll get away with crimes because you're simply the king's or queen's son or daughter. Um, so it's unusual, in fact, that this got to the point where in the United States they were brought to a courtroom. I mean, it wasn't a criminal courtroom, it was a civil courtroom, but still that is a very big change and then ultimately a settlement. It certainly does feel like a very different, uh, approach to the wrongdoings of the of the uh, of the royal family this is a complete change in tradition mm-hmm. for settlements by the royal family it strikes me as well that prince charles has his own issues in this realm we've covered it in the show that there are people associated with prince charles that have also committed uh, you know acts of abuse against children that he's been very supportive of and in fact that many people believe that that, that he might have some culpability in it and then, of course, today we also found out that his trust was under investigation because he has been, you know, giving away titles, I guess, or passports um, and titles to people who have lots of money and were invested or helped him fix up a cottage or two or something like that. So do you know very much about what's going on with the Charles case at all? I know it's a bit distant from the Epstein case, but it is interesting that there's another big scandal brewing right at the same time. Well, it's an investigation currently. There are no claims. Right. And nothing has been charged criminally and no claim civilly. So it's a, another problem, serious problem. Yeah. Yeah, so We're is. waiting to see what takes place. That's not going to be that serious. I don't think so either. People know the details of this one. But, you know, it is interesting that the Queen yeah, just last week said that Camilla will be the Queen consort. And uh, I wonder if that's because... She might be the most sensible person in that relationship, and, and maybe King Charles might need a powerful queen next to him to help, uh, you know, tame his sort of crazier instincts. But um, let's leave that for another day. We don't have to talk about that. Let's talk about Ghislaine a little bit further. You know, the one thing sure. uh, you brought to light when we first spoke, and I think this was a real break for a lot of people in this investigation, was knowing that Ghislaine and Jeffrey Epstein had met a full decade earlier than they had publicized. You know, the common theory had always been that she had arrived in the United States in 1991, just as her father was buying the Daily News. And at that time, she arrived into the arms of Jeffrey Epstein, her her new boyfriend, because she'd just broken up with her previous one. But what you told me, and I think this was the first time it was ever revealed, was that they had previously met in the early 90s and that they had developed some sort of relationship as early as then. Is that right? They met probably in the last part of the 80s. Mm-hmm. And they were growing their relationship and their love triangle with her father, Robert Maxwell, and Jeffrey Epstein, and Jelaine Maxwell. It was prospering at the end of the 80s and early 90s, yes, before what was published. Yes. And so it's interesting that you have contested, and I guess. Other people have agreed with you and confirmed this information that in the handover between Robert Maxwell and Ghislaine Maxwell, there's a role for Jeffrey Epstein to be played there as well, that there was some sort of function that he played as they... There was a big role that Robert Maxwell used Jeffrey Epstein for. Mm -hmm. Yes, a very substantial role. Well, Jeffrey Epstein was an advisor to Robert Maxwell in the crisis of financing the Maxwell property, media companies, media outlets, media publications, and all the businesses under the Maxwell holding companies. Jeffrey Epstein was in that crisis with Robert Maxwell and with Jelaine Maxwell in order to solve the enormous stress being brought on the Maxwell companies. This is actually a significant amount of news that you just shared. I don't believe it's well known at all that Jeffrey Epstein played a role in the organizing and settlement of the finances of Robert Maxwell in his, you know, just before his death, as he was having a crisis of mammoth proportions because he wasn't able to finance his empire. And he was running around trying to find all sorts of different funding. And what you're saying now is that Jeffrey Epstein was an advisor to Robert Maxwell during that period of time? Yes, that's correct. How do you know that? Well, I'm Jeffrey Epstein. I mean, still, how do you know it? How do you know that he's there? How do you know well, that... Well, when I say, when I say from Jeffrey Epstein, mm-hmm. 
That means that Epstein told me. He told specific you. Specific points. Yeah. Well, he without to- narrating the, without giving you the narrative, which I don't choose to do mm-hmm. because of this great mystery, Jeffrey Epstein acknowledged that he was on the team. There's, if you do a lot of research, if people do a lot of research, they will see that Jeffrey Epstein was in the loop with Robert Maxwell before the Robert Maxwell death. It's, so, it is true. And no I can back you up in some of this. I can back you up that certainly in uh, you know, Ari ben Menashe, who some people would question as a source, I do not in this case. I absolutely believe what he says about Jeffrey Epstein in 1982, uh, when they were still running the Iran-Contra affair, and Maxwell was running the arms shipping for the Israelis, or for lots of people, I guess, during the Iran-Contra affair, that that's when he met uh, Jeffrey Epstein. And he was introduced to Jeffrey Epstein as you know, Jeff Epstein. And I remember him saying that he thought that Robert Maxwell believed that Jeffrey Epstein was going to be the future uh, husband of Ghislaine Maxwell. And that Ari ben Nashi believed that Maxwell had introduced Epstein already to his bosses, meaning the Mossad bosses or the uh, military intelligence bosses in Israel, and that they had a, given him a green light to hire him. And that, in fact, Ari ben Menashe is the one who said, no, I don't want to hire him. But we know as well that Jeffrey Epstein was involved in arms dealing at the same time, right there in London. That's what he was working on. With in London, he was working on the Al Yamana arms deal, which was the big Saudi Arabian arms deal. So we do know that he was Correct. around at that time. But I have not heard. Correct. This is the first time I'm hearing from anybody, although I have heard it from you before, but not publicly, that that you're saying that um, that in the final months or weeks before Robert Maxwell died, that Jeffrey Epstein was handling his finances or at least advising him on his finances. What I'm saying to you is that Jeffrey Epstein participated with others in advising Robert Maxwell in his finances. Hmm. Yes, absolutely. Well, that's incredible. I mean, you know, people have to think about this in a different way if they, because most people don't really think about these two storylines as continuum, but they really are a continuum. You've got, you know, the Robert Maxwell story, which sort of starts at the end of the Second World War, you know, he's obviously before, but that's when we start picking up the interesting detail around it. He, you know, has a very interesting life as a, as a spy for various agencies, multiple different names, and then lands up becoming this huge mogul in, in the UK. And when they arrive in the UK, he and his wife, he marries a French woman who is part of the royal ecosystem or royal family ecosystem. And that Ghislaine, when she was raised, was raised in the Buckingham Palace backyard along with Prince Andrew, that they know each other all the way back then. So it's, it's not like this was a new encounter in when they were introducing Andrew to Virginia Giffrey, that Ghislaine had known Andrew since her childhood. Yes, and they were in a very serious triangle love affair at the time that we're talking about mm-hmm. earlier on when Andrew and Jelaine were a serious couple. They were indeed. They were a very serious couple and there was a lot of concern around some of, of what they were doing and that she might be a little too wild for him. I remember that at the time. But the continuing yeah. we're talking about is that many people think that, you know, in terms of him being a spy, in terms of Maxwell being sort of what they call Israel's super spy or whatever you want to call him, uh, he, that she is the continuation of his work. In other words, she, he was almost part one of, of a two-part story and that Ghislaine continued his work in the United States. Do you agree with that? Do you agree that, that there's a sort of a continuum there? Yes. Why was there a continuum? Not, not on the side because the mega empire was being dismantled by the authorities and there were court proceedings against the mega empire continuously. Mm-hmm. But whatever Jelaine and Epstein could continue, they did. Mm-hmm. And it was very beneficial to Epstein and Jelaine. Well, sure. I mean, he's a guy from, I don't know, Coney Island or wherever he's from. And suddenly he's a very rich guy, you know, and uh, where did all the money come from? People wanted to know. Some people said it's from his businesses, but, you know, there's some question marks around that. And so the money could have possibly, maybe, would you say, come from Maxwell himself? Money, you see, now we've got to be very careful Mm -hmm. because I don't know that the litigations are over. 
Right. But I can say to you that in my opinion, there's no doubt that monies came from Maxwell to Epstein. Mm -hmm. Maxwell businesses to Epstein. So what you're saying you know? is that you know, could, Ghislaine couldn't get the money, of course, because Ghislaine was subject to the same bankruptcy issues that her father had. I don't think she was able to be the heir of all this money because how, where did she get it from? He was meant to be bankrupt. He had, he had, you know, he'd lost so much money. So perhaps the, the way that it was handed down to her was through Epstein. No question about it. We established for the public's benefit at the trial of Julian that $30 million dollars changed hands from Epstein to Jerome. Mm -hmm. Now, that was not all the money. That was a portion of the money from Epstein to Jerome Maxwell. Mm -hmm. There was I, no question of the $30 million. Thankful you raised that. And I'm so thankful you did that in the court case because it is important that people realize that there was this giant gift of money, but probably much more. In fact, you know, if there were hundreds of millions of dollars, many people think that maybe Ghislaine was the one running the operation, but Epstein had the checkbook because that's where it landed up after Maxwell died. The money landed up with, with Epstein. Epstein, with Jerome's help, did over $100 billion in sales, in turnover of revenue, not in Epstein profits or Jerome profits, but in actual transactions. Epstein did over $100 billion in transactions. Through Over what? Economy. Through uh, his many money laundering Through schemes? Through everything, or? there were many schemes, mm -hmm. many schemes, an endless amount of schemes. They've never done a forensic audit mm -hmm. of Southern Trust. Mm -hmm. It's never been done. Well, we should and probably do that. Times, we should probably why? That. Who's going to do it? Well, you know, there may be some, interested, some interesting part, interested parties that want to do it. I, it. It feels to me that there is the biggest story of the entire Epstein saga is not, I mean, the girls are very important. They under, this was a very difficult and trying thing that they did, and they did it in order to give themselves a cover story. What they really were doing, the real crimes, like, I don't say they're not real crimes, but the, the more serious stakes that were being traded and dealt with were in the money laundering. I mean, there was just seems to be endless schemes like your own in Towers Financial where, you know, millions and millions, if you're saying a hundred billion dollars, I, I find that quite plausible when you think about how much money they must have laundered through the various schemes that they had. Because I could count maybe five or six um, when I was doing my research and, and yours is just one of them for $450 million. But, you know, all of that sort of compounds on itself, and then the and then you get extra, you know. But it wasn't it wasn't four hundred fifty million. It was over two billion a year. Right, right, right. Because that's that actual kept on turning over. Right, actual transactions. Fascinating. So it, the real story is never going to be told. It's too hot. You know what? Too sensitive. Yeah. Never going to be told. Oh. And that was Epstein's plan. Never to tell the whole story. He told you that? He said to you, I'm never, the, the whole story is never going to come out? Yep. Interesting. Yes. I am looking at, I'm going to show everyone, and you can't see this, unfortunately, but I'll send it to you um, afterwards. I've, I've been able to dig up a lot of information about Maxwell's various businesses. And there are many, many businesses and looked at the very structures of them. And there's two charts here. And, you know, maybe our very ardent researchers who watch the show can dig away at some of this stuff. But I'm looking at these you know, Maxwell Communication Corporation, which owns Millen Computer Publishing, Berlitz, Panini, Nimbus Records, Maxwell Consumer Publishing, International Learning Systems, Official Airline Guides. It just goes on and on and on. Just one of the, that's one company. Then he owned the private interests, which he also had in Maxwell Aviation, in the Lady Ghislaine. We know about that. The AGB International, the independent group. He had 6% of that. He had 50% of Thomas Cook America Travel, Oxford United Football Club. He had for, what, 10,000 pounds? Who knew you could buy Oxford for 10,000 pounds? The European newspaper, the Berliner Zeitung Modi'in, the Israeli newspaper, the Robert Maxwell Business School, and the New York Daily News. These are all assets that he landed up happening. It's interesting that the New York Daily News was ultimately sold to Mort Zuckerman, who you must know. You must know Mort Zuckerman. Yeah, I was in uh, a very substantial litigation with the Daily News about the New York Post. Right. When I took over the New York Post. Right. 
There was a lot of conflict between the Daily News and the New York Post, and Mort didn't want me to take over the New York Post. He wanted to take it over and consolidate the circulation, the buyers of both newspapers into one mega newspaper. And Mort had a great plan, great plan. But I stopped that. You stopped it. You're not, you, do, you, do you think it would have been better if he would succeeded in that? No. Why would you? Well, I think it would have been better if I didn't enter the picture, yes. Oh, yeah, really? Interesting yes, to hear you I say do. That. Interesting to hear you say that. And then he goes, you know, 54% of the Murray Group newspapers, which owned, by the way, 26% of Quebec Corps, 26% of Donahue, the Daily Mirror, the Sunday Mirror, the Daily record the Sunday people and sporting life. I mean, we're talking about a massive, massive empire that these are, this is at his death. You know, the size of this particular empire was, it was just enormous. And what you're saying is that Jeffrey Epstein in those days, well, while Maxwell was having real trouble financing all these businesses, that he was the advisor. What exactly does that mean? Advisor? What was he advising him on? Well, there were different traumas taking place. There were different amounts of money that had to be paid at different times. Mm -hmm. And there were different stress levels coming from the people, creditors, institutions that were owed this massive amount of money. Mm -hmm. So Epstein was called upon to provide advice, solutions in different plans of how to deal with these problems. And that's what Jeffrey advised Maxwell on, yes. what to do about all of the finances. This... So it wasn't just Jeffrey alone. Mm -hmm. There was a, probably 100 people in the advisory team inside the company and outside the company. Oh, definitely 100 with the orders of lawyers that were providing advice along with Epstein to Robert Maxwell. Yeah, I recall but, a story. But they don't want to admit to that. Mm -hmm. This is a big issue that the two brothers don't want to admit to at all. There was any financial uh, planning around the stealing of the money? Because really. it would yeah. be the stealing of money, really, is what they're talking about. I mean, this money was meant to have been lost. They stole a lot of money out of the pension funds of the Daily Mirror and a bunch of other places. And, you know, for all intents and purposes, that money was gone. So by admitting that Epstein was involved in any of that, they would have been admitting that it was stolen money and admitting their own gifts. Yeah, well, it was the question of money laundering. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah. that's what it was. Exactly. So I recall a story where, I think he's in the uh, Croc or something like that. In, he runs a security firm in New York. And I recall reading a story about Maxwell going to him at some distress prior to his death and saying to him, I'm really concerned about my life, but I'm also concerned about my businesses. There's a conspiracy to destroy me. And uh, asking for this private investigative firm to uh, help him out um, in terms of figuring out who it was who was trying to destroy him. And there was a dossier created. I'm not sure what happened to that dossier, but in the last few months of Robert Maxwell's life, there was it was very difficult. There's no doubt it was very, very difficult. He, he was had stolen a lot of this money, but he's also trying to keep everything afloat uh, in terms of these businesses. And then ultimately, you know, was it a death or was it a murder or was it a suicide? Who knows? Really, when you think about it it's now in the context of all this information around these businesses. But he was in great distress, wasn't he, before he died? Terrible distress. Mm -hmm. It was very serious. He was having enormous pressure financially. And he didn't have solutions readily available. So it was horrible for him. Yeah. And he was desperate for solutions. One theory and is that he went on board that Ghislaine and traveled to, where was it? Just outside um, so Cyprus, where he fell off the boat. I think it was uh, Cyprus. You know, I he, think the I. The Canary Islands? Canary Islands. Sorry. Thank you very much for correcting me. So the Canary Islands. That one theory is that he went there because he was told that he was going to receive a payment there. There were people going to meet him and give him a check of some sort, or I don't know how it worked, to help him out with these finances. And so some people feel like that was maybe a setup by his murderers. Well, there's been the conspiracy theories mm -hmm. 
well published continuously, mm. but they haven't come up with any claims that have gone into a courtroom. Mm-hmm. So yes. Nobody knows. And the same thing with Jeffrey Epstein. Nobody knows what really happened to a vast amount of money and why. And why he died. No, yeah, we just don't know. Yeah, there's been no investigation. That's true. I mean, there really hasn't been an investigation. There was a cover-up, clearly, in the prison system. So we never found out about how Epstein died either. And the you know flimsy investigation that happened after it was never really, there was meant to be something coming out recently. And I don't think it ever did. I don't think anything ever landed in terms of a mm-hmm. final investigation you know, on that. Maybe it's still to come out. We'll see. But it is. You know, I don't think it's ever going to come out. Mm-hmm. I doubt it. Do you have an idea of Nobody how, wants it to, of how Epstein wants died? To come out. Do you have an idea of how Epstein died? I'd listen to Mark Epstein's entire story of what he tells. Mm-hmm. And I'd listen to people close to Jeffrey Epstein and what they say. And I can't answer that with any evidence. So there's no way to give you that evidence. Yeah. That would only be speculation. Right. And there is only speculation in this case. I mean, there's certainly some evidence that he was, you know, that there was a a different, he didn't hang himself, that it was not possible for him to hang himself, that he must have been strangled somehow. But, uh, you know, who knows what ultimately happened. You're never going to know. The Mm -hmm. public's never going to know. Before I leave the business side of it, and I do want to discuss a lot of these other issues, but I just want to quickly look at one more slide here because uh, you can't see this again, but I just want to show it to everyone because it goes with the same theme. This is another slide. It's showing how Robert Maxwell's tangled empire is structured. It's mind boggling when you look at all the holding companies and boards and investment firms, and it's just endless. It seems like it's, it's a giant sheet and it just goes on and on and on. I don't think it's ever been revealed in as much detail as we're showing here, but it certainly shows that they built an empire. And I don't know if this was Jeffrey Epstein or, or just they did it by uh, Robert Maxwell on his own. They built it almost with the intention of hiding a lot of them in a very complicated structure. You know, it wasn't necessary to build it this way, but they created an architecture that would make it a really opaque. It was dramatic. Mm -hmm. It was something never done before. This was bigger than anything else at that time. And even in history, it's one of the biggest. Mm -hmm. Maxwell is one of the most famous in history. And what gave him the, why do you think he did it? I mean, was he doing it under orders? Was he doing it just to gain the wealth? What was it about Robert Maxwell that made him such a huge thief at the end of his life. The question of power and greed is a tagline with Robert Maxwell for the last 10 years of his life. Mm -hmm. So there's no doubt that he loved power and loved money. He's proven that in everything he did. Mm -hmm. So it's an amazing life. That he led. It is amazing. A really incredible life that he, you know, originated out of a small part of Eastern Europe as a as a refugee, really, and then also claimed. But at the end of his life, landed up being a huge mogul, owning all these massive companies, owning all these media empires, and having so much influence around the world. We showed a picture earlier on of all the world leaders that he was so close to, to Gorbachev and to Thatcher, and even to the Queen herself. You know, he is. He really was an incredible instigator of history as well, because he was able to, some people say, uh, be help Gorbachev through those final years of his reign and help bring down the Soviet Union um, and also be responsible for the refuseniks uh, leaving uh, Russia, leaving the Soviet Union to the United States. I mean, these are massive things to undertake for an individual. And yet he seems to have done that. He did it. Mm -hmm. He did an incredible job Mm -hmm. of consolidating power and influence and access to the top leadership of several countries. It was amazing what he accomplished. And yet he was a troubled guy too. I mean, he had, a, he, he really was, I think, much more of a pedophile or at least had an interest in very young girls that, you know, that would have made him, in some respects, more dangerous a predator than Epstein. Well, he had more influence than mm-hmm. Epstein ever had. Mm-hmm. And he had a much bigger business than Epstein ever had mm-hmm. for many more years than Epstein 
did in his business is that Epstein ran. There was no comparison between the size of Maxwell and the smaller size of Epstein. No comparison. Right. There is a story that was, has been validated about him being a person of interest in the death of Robert Maxwell. The Jeffrey Epstein was a person of interest. Uh, do you know about much of that? I mean, it certainly ties in with what you're saying here because he was a um, obviously advising him, as you say, in the final days of his life. You know, is it possible that he was also maybe intentionally, you know, maybe that it was Epstein involved in his death in any way, as far as you're concerned? It's not going to come out. Mm hmm. That story's not going to be told. Mm -hmm. So it's, isn't it amazing that the inside story and the questions you're asking are not going to be answered? Well, there's and lots there's of research. Biggest scam but we're never going to find out officially. I mean, that's the truth of it. The truth of it, this is the end of the road for the legal attempts to find out about Jeffrey Epstein. We are in the final throes here of our opportunity to find out about it. And we're not going to find out about it unless, you know, someone opens some whatever magical file vault there is somewhere and says, here you go, take a look. Cause I just feel like being a magnanimous to the world. What we're going to be left with is a lot of these questions that, you know, are validated by some of the testimony that you're providing here. I mean, you know, you're one of the very few people, and I've spoken to many people, but you're one of the very few people who had these kind of conversations with Epstein about all these really critical things. And you know, your evidence that you're providing is so valuable because there's no one else who can answer all these questions. And uh, it is incredible that we're never going to find out the truth for what is clearly at least one of the biggest crime sprees ever. I mean, Epstein was a big criminal. And so was Maxwell. But I mean, Epstein was a really big criminal in the United States. He committed incredible amounts of crimes, financial crimes I'm talking about. Epstein was much larger than Al Capone in comparison to money at the different time frames. Mm -hmm. And Epstein's story will never be told because they don't want it told. Mm -hmm. That's just the way it is. Well, I uh, do not want the story told. Yeah. I wonder why. I, you know, it seems like a lot of the players are not of around course. anymore. I mean, we sort of know in the broad strokes of it. Why not just share the, with the world what's, you know, what happened? Because they, there's too many people still affected mm -hmm. by this scandal that have important contributions taking place in politics today. Right. And that's why it can't be told. Interesting. These are important people. And they don't want the story told. And it won't be told. If um, Ghislaine Maxwell strikes a deal now, a plea be a bargain to get her out of whatever say, jail sentence, if she says, I will tell everyone the story, do you think she... That, no, she, that, she's never going to She's talk. not going to do that. She's never going to do it because it's just a life-ending event. She may win if she gets another trial. Mm-hmm. And they lose the victims that testified, which they already said they're going to lose one victim out of the four. Right. She could win the right. next trial, and that will be the end of it. Mm -hmm. Or she could get a treaty transfer to the UK, and that will be the end of it. Mm. Fascinating. So she'll be all right. She'll be all right. Yeah, I'm sure she will be. I, I you know... I it's the truth I always worry about because I don't know if we're ever, you know, this I actually, we've tried so many times, you and I, and, and so many others have tried to piece together some of these stories for the public, but you know, it's so hard to get at the actual fullness of the whole story because it's so dramatic and it's, it's so many crimes and it's such a lot of money, as you point out, a hundred billion dollars potentially um, over a lifetime of crime. It really is quite a lot. No major media outlet has decided that they wanted to expose the entire inside story. Mm -hmm. The Washington Post, the Miami Herald, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, many other outlets covered it, substantial mm -hmm. covered it, but nobody really got inside. Yeah. No one. And the reason there That's, is because they're owned by the same people, a lot of them, or at least allies of the same people, right? I mean, there's a lot of the same kind of uh, media ownership structures in the United States that we've spoken about in the show many, many times that uh, are very allied to these kind of interests, these sort of big money interests that Epstein represented. Yes, definitely associations. Mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. probably not partnerships, the common interest is benefits running to many sides of the page mm-hmm. of these powerful media outlets. Mm-hmm. And that's why it's not going to be told. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Nobody wants to tell it. On the screen now, you're not going to be able to see it, but I've got on the screen a, um, a wheel in the center of it is Jeffrey Epstein. But around it, it goes, it looks at all his sort of main contacts throughout the years. And it's, it starts in 1982 and there's uh, Adnan Khashoggi, uh, which is when he met uh, Jeffrey Epstein in 1982, which, which does tie in with Ari Ben Menashe was saying about him being approached to be a part of the Iran-Contra negotiations. Well, Seattle. Epstein was not approached on his own merit. He was approached by Adnan, by Douglas Gleese, mm-hmm. who had a partnership in a business agreement with Adnan. And Epstein advised Douglas Gleese about that transaction. This and is worked a huge under transaction. Douglas Lease, 38, what is it, 38 billion? I think so. And it was over a period of time for a massive amount of arms going to Saudi Arabia, basically. Uh, really helped lift the British arms industry for a long period of time there. Very important to the economy of the UK. And Epstein yeah. uh, conducted that deal as an advisor for Lease, as you point out, and Adan Khashoggi was the other side of it. And it appears to me that Lease took away about 30% of that deal, maybe not as a personal commission, but certainly as uh, commissions for all the people he would have to pay off along the way. And oh, so, billions of dollars were paid. Yeah. Billions. Including potentially paid. to the to Prince Andrew, who was also involved in this. Well, Prince Andrew's story's not going to be told either. (laughs) I was trying to get you there. (laughs) I don't think I I was was trying to lead you into a cul-de-sac, as they say. But, you know, I I know Andrew was involved in some of those arms deals that Epstein would later be involved in and Andrew Khashoggi was involved in. And so it's interesting, you know, as they were paying themselves 30% commission for some of these deals, maybe some of that money did go to the royal family. Well, Andrew... Did very well financially with his relationship with Epstein. And that was the only reason for the relationship right. with the girls and the money. Right. People think it's Sex all about the, the girls, but it's really not. That wasn't the driving, it was no. the driving force, but not the driving force. The driving force was the royal family's money. There was a lot of money that was being, some of it very legitimately, you know, illegitimately, but still because they're their royal family, they're allowed to do these kinds of things, like trading arms. That's one of the things that royal family can do, I guess, they were able to make a lot of money off these transactions. They, you know, and royal yeah. family is expensive. It's expensive to run that household. It's expensive to run the yes. crown and you need money to upkeep yes. all those castles and things. So you get a lot of this money through these, you know, enterprises that you might have where Andrew's running around the world, maybe negotiating some arms deals and, and Epstein's facilitating them. There was a lot yes. of talk around the time when Epstein arrived in the United States that he was in fact a manager of the queen's money which may be the case. I mean, maybe not as directly as that, but it may be that he was actually, uh, that he managed a, a large portion of her money related to some of these deals. Well, I'm not going to get into mm-hmm. that because that's a very big, wide conversation. Yeah. But he was, without question, financially involved with Andrew, mm-hmm. the Queen's son. Yeah. There was a heavy financial involvement there. And that would be the access to what you're bringing to the table. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's very unusual, that's for sure. Because that's very, about, very unusual. And that is around the same time that he met Adnan Khashoggi, he met uh, Ghislaine Maxwell. So that would tie in as well with Andrew. That's interesting that they all happened around the same time. And then, you know, at the end of Maxwell's life, Robert Maxwell's life, she moved to the United States and that's where she officially met Jeffrey Epstein. But meanwhile, there were other introductions going on to Jeffrey Epstein in the United States. And one of them was to, to Wexner, which was 1985 to 1987. He worked for Wexner in Ohio as sort of a fixer guy, I guess. And they got into a little bit of trouble. Some people think around a potential murder of somebody, but a short period of time then with Wexner, but it, he didn't stay there very long. Well, actually, the financial records show that there was ties together for 16 years. Mm. So, so I've seen all the way to 2001. Oh, it didn't start at 82 or 83. It started later on. I have 85 to 87 and is when it started. No, those dates are wrong. Okay. Okay. 
Wait, there what? are more detailed dates, but it's huge. So the, it's gigantic. The Wexner Association with Epstein lasted 16 years, you're saying, and had, and it's gigantic, by, even by his standards. There were transactions tied together for 16 years. Mm-hmm. You know, yes, it's amazing. That's how wrong it was. Yeah. It's amazing when you think about the fact that, you know, a lot of the time Epstein represented himself to the victims that he has he approached, or at least a couple of times. He's used the, the line that, you know, he wanted them to be Victoria's Secret's models, or he was going to give them an opportunity to be Victoria's Secret models. And of course, the owner of Victoria's Secret was Wexner. Um, and it may not have been that far fetched that some of the women in that uh, Victoria's Secret fashion show, which everyone, you know, loved to ogle at for the years it was on TV. It may have actually been a result of human trafficking. There's been talk about that mm-hmm. a great deal. Mm-hmm. Yes. Mm-hmm. A lot of talk. 1987, he meets oh. you, right? Is that right? Yes. And then tell everyone the story again. I know we're running out of time, but I just want everyone to hear this incredible story of how you were introduced to Jeffrey Epstein in 1987. So Douglas Lees comes up to you and, and introduces him. And tell, me, tell everyone again the story because it's so fascinating. How much more time do you have? We've got eight minutes only to the end of the show. So you're going to have to give me the Coles notes. <laughs> <laughs> well, Douglas Lee's wanted to transfer Epstein out of Europe and out of the Douglas Lee's operations and move him back to America. And that was the purpose of using me, manipulating me, into this Epstein relationship by lease, mm-hmm. who was a partner in Towers Financial Businesses. So it's a very deep-rooted, unusual manipulation that I got sucked into and stupidly went along with when I shouldn't have got near this at all. But well, how would you have known? That's the... the flags were there. Because mm-hmm. Epstein was introduced but, to you as, as being, you know, had been stealing some money or had been maybe misappropriating oh, some money? Epstein was always facing claims of taking money mm-hmm. illegally. Mm-hmm. For years, for years, from the early 80s, nonstop, into and up to his death in prison. So there was always claims floating about Epstein and illegal money. That never stopped. But it has never been a forensic audit. And Epstein's partner in these crimes for decades is still running Epstein's estate, Gary Indyke. Is he still running the estate? That's running. interesting. That's really interesting that he's still running the estate. That's a- I mean, how do you have a partner still running the estate in St. Thomas? They seem to have, done, they seem to have broken it. all the rules everywhere. So I, you know, I think they've got special powers, these guys. I, That's right. You met Epstein at the same time that Donald Trump met Epstein and at the same time that uh, Thomas Barack met Epstein. That's the same year. What was going on in that year in 1987 uh, that made him such a man about town? I could not give you the dates that Trump and Barack Mm -hmm. met Epstein. Trump and Barack had a very close relationship and I did a very large transaction with Barack at Towers Financial. He bought Towers Financial out. Right. And that transaction signed contract, but they canceled it as part of the scheme and sold it to another man named John Hall, Mm -hmm. who was a criminal. I want to underline this, what you're saying for everybody here, because it is an unknown part of the story. And you've you've said it in some ways on the show before, but it is incredibly fascinating what happened with Thomas Barrack and the and the Towers Financial Operation. That Thomas, he bought Towers Financial. He was going to save. You. He was going to save the company, right? He was going to. He was going to buy it. He would have saved. Yeah. He would have saved the company mm-hmm. without question, and that's why it's such a disappointment for me mm-hmm. that they broke that that Epstein broke that transaction, participated in breaching that transaction. Is that an intentional and, breach? Do you think that that was done in order, yeah, to, in order for Epstein yeah. to get that money? There was no question it was wow. intentional. So Barrack would have uh, agreed on a number with you, made the deal, and then on purpose 
with Epstein, found a way to break it in order for Epstein to then steal whatever was left of a now bankrupt company. Yes. Yeah. Unbelievable. What a saga. Oh, I have so many more questions yeah. to ask you, but I want to read one last we'll thing. Do it. We'll, we'll do another one. We'll do it another time. I, do want to, I want to read one last thing from New York Magazine, which describes Jeffrey Epstein's business. And it said, uh, from the get-go, his business was successful, but the conditions for investing with Epstein were steep. He would take total control of the billion dollars, charge a flat rate, and something, I get power of attorney, I guess, to do whatever he thought was necessary to advance his client's financial cause. And he remain, remained true to the $1 billion entry fee. So that's interesting. According to people who knew him, if you were worth $700 million and felt the need for the services of Epstein and company, you would receive a not so polite, no thank you from Epstein. You had to be worth a billion dollars or more to work with him. I mean, just that's a that's a hell of a benchmark for a clientele. It limits you quite, quite a story. It quite limits you to story. very few people, right? I mean, there's not that many billionaires at that time. If that's your clientele that you're going after, you're going after the very richest, the very most famous people, the world's biggest money makers, uh, and that's who you're working with, and uh, and you're the world's biggest criminal. So it certainly does. Yeah. <laughs> it paints the, the, this thing, this painting, this uh, image of of the you know the greatest criminal of our at least the last century. You know, you can't think of anyone who's committed more crimes than Jeffrey Epstein when you look at the totality of everything that he's done. And, and Amazing. An unbelievable story. Yes. Unbelievable. It's been so nice to catch up with you again. And thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. It's, uh, sure. it's, we, we, it's been too long. We should, happy to do it. We should do some more. Tell everyone exactly how they can find you on, on Twitter. Well, I'm on Twitter under Stephen Hoffenberg. All right. So, so it's at Stephen Hoffenberg. Yeah. All right. Uh, Stephen, thank you so much for being here tonight. I really appreciate it. Uh, we'll do more in the future and, uh, and have a good night. Good night. Bye-bye. Uh, Bye-bye. Isn't that great? So nice to have Stephen Hoffenberg back on the show after a long period of time. They're discussing all these really fascinating and interesting things that we had never discussed, even though we've had so many conversations. And I think the things to take away tonight is that you've got a relationship there between Epstein and Maxwell towards the end of Robert Maxwell's life which has never really been fully understood. And I think that was a lot of breaking news, actually. Can you believe all these years later, still some breaking news. What uh, Hoffenberg was saying that was so critical about Jeffrey Epstein being an advisor to Robert Maxwell in the days and weeks leading up to his death. You know, think about the financial chaos of that giant chart that I showed you of all those businesses and think how hard it would be to figure out what to do with all those and knowing that a lot of it was you know, stolen and funneled into offshore bank accounts that you are now going to have to be responsible for in the United States when Ghislaine Maxwell would arrive there. I mean, it's a massive, massive, massive operation. There's no other way to think about it. And it makes me wonder about Maxwell's death and about whether it was, you know, uh, you know maybe, was it agreed upon? Did he know he was going to die at that night? You know, it certainly leads one to suggest that it could have been. So many more questions I would love to ask Steve Hoffenberg, and I would love to know the answers to that we still do not know. We still do not know the true relationship with the royal family that he had. You know, was he actually their manager of their money? Or was it just a little bit of the money that he was managing? We don't know the nature and size of the financial crimes that Jeffrey Epstein committed. We don't know um, his relationship with all the presidents. I mean, he had relationships with Bill Clinton very famously, as we all know, with Donald Trump very famously, as we all know. But there's also some relationships with the Bushes, and that'll be interesting to find out as well. We don't know how Epstein died. We don't know the role of Kirkland and Ellis in, in all of this. And we don't know where the money is. And when it comes to Ghislaine, you know, there are supposedly eight Johns in sealed indictments that were going to be revealed. The names of eight Johns were going to be revealed, famous people, presumably. Those re indictments remain sealed. And I don't see a day anytime soon that they'll be coming out. And we just don't know who was blackmailed, if they were blackmailed, and what that did to our foreign policy, to our national policy, to our financing and business sector, to our technology center. We just don't have the answers about what this career criminal did to the entire fabric of the American people. So we just don't know if we're still dealing with the implications and the, and the effects of those crimes. And I bet you we are. I bet you they're still very present. So this is just a, a taste of some of the stuff we're going to be doing in the next few months as we unpack some really interesting information about Epstein and in overall about Silicon Valley and about technology and about Hollywood that's coming up in the next few months. That's all the show we have for tonight. Thank you very much for being here. Really appreciate Steve being here as well. I am probably not going to be here Friday because I, I could use a day off. Lots going on lately. 
So I might take the day off. It's President's Day um, weekend, so I might do that. Um, but if anything happens news-wise, you can count on me being back here and there's sure is to be news in the next few days. That's all from me tonight and have a good night, everybody. Narrative is made possible by viewers like you. Join today and support truly independent journalism at patreon.com forward slash narrative. That's patreon.com forward slash narrative.